On behalf of the MDR Run Collaborative, my name is Irina Yudin, and in Module 5 we will be discussing both the Tora synthesis and pair synthesis procedures. Just like the previous tutorials, we will give a quick definition of the procedure and discuss in more details indications of these procedures, the safety considerations, intra- and post-procedure care and monitoring, as well as complications that they can result from these interventions. Our hope is that the education from these tutorials will prepare you to do work more competently and collaboratively with your physician colleagues and provide the safest care for your patients. We will talk about thoracentesis first. The thoracentesis is the pleural tap. It's an invasive procedure to remove fluid or air from the pleural space for diagnostic or therapeutic purposes. The vast majority of TAPs yield useful clinical information. The TAP is considered therapeutic when large volume of fluid accumulated in the pleural space is removed, resulting in ease of symptoms and an improvement of lung function. The most common causes of pleural effusions requiring a TAP are cancer, CHF, pneumonia, and recent surgery. We just mentioned a few of the most common causes of pleural effusions. Now let's quickly run through a more comprehensive list of conditions or indications for thoracentesis. CHF, cancer, pneumonia, and surgery as just mentioned. Also cirrhosis, nephrotic syndrome, pulmonary embolism, trauma, TB, rheumatoid arthritis. Some of the absolute and relative contraindications include Patient's anatomy that makes it difficult to establish appropriate landmarks to proceed with the established procedural technique. Coagulopathies. High PEEP. Patients with splenomegaly, elevated left hemidiaphragm or left-sided pleural effusion. Patients with one lung after pneumonectomy or with significant lung disease. You can see where some of these contraindications are relative and need to be balanced with the potential benefits of the procedure. Many of our patients present with histories of significant lung disease, develop pleural effusions that interfere with oxygenation and or ventilation, requiring BiPAP or impending intubation. Without the top, they could potentially open themselves up to further complications associated with mechanical ventilation. These situations are great opportunities for nurses to share their observations of a patient clinical threshold with their MD colleagues to influence the safest decisions. Given the need to proceed, start to think about what equipment is needed to get the patient through this procedure. Have a working understanding as to whether this is a therapeutic tap, diagnostic tap, or both. All right, here is a list of things you to get ready for your thoracentesis. Procedure card. If this is a therapeutic tap and the patient has a large pleural effusions, double check to make sure you have enough of the vacutainer stocked in the procedure card or clean utility room before you get started. If not, call down to central and order them. Portable ultrasound and thoracentesis kit. You will find them in the side door of the procedure card as well as mentioned in the first tutorial. Anesthetic, two chemistry tubes, side table, and extra pillows. These should already be in your room for you. If you're doing a diagnostic tap, you may also need to gather blood, fungal, and TB culture bottles. The blood cultures bottles and CBC tubes should be in your nurse server ready to go. In the event of emergency, make sure your code card is available and be sure you have an ample bag and a high flow non breather mask set up in your room. Now that you are set up and ready to go, remember your standards of procedural safety and complete your pre-procedure care. Consider past medical history and what may place your patient at increased risk, particularly pulmonary and cardiovascular health history. Do they require mechanical ventilation or near to it? Have a clear understanding of their baseline oxygenation and hemodynamic status before initiating the procedure. Do they have a coagulopathy and do you need to take any step to mitigate bleeding risks? Think of allergies. 
Be sure to check in with your patient and family to explain the procedure and see if they have any further questions. Check to make sure that the proceduralist is credentialed to perform the intervention. Oftentimes, the fellow will support this procedure. Finally, be sure the consent is signed and initiate documentation in a timeout before the procedure gets underway. Like we talked about in our first tutorial, these intra-procedural interventions are largely targeted at maintaining sterility and safety. Start by double-checking yourself to make sure you have everything you need for the procedure in the room, including any additional vacutainer bottles or well suction containers to collect drainage, culture bottles, supplemental O2 masks, and Ambu setup. Then wash your hands for at least 15 seconds. Put on a cap, mask, and gloves. Maintain sterile procedure with all assists. If you are holding the patient to assist, be sure to avoid getting near the sterile drapes. Keep an eye on the patient's respiratory status. Call out oxygen saturation and heart rate, if necessary, to alert proceduralists to changes from baseline, or offer reassurance of tolerance and stability during procedure. Assist with fluid collection if required. Immediate post-procedure care is focused on ensuring hemostasis at the puncture site and that vital signs and oxygenation return to or maintained at the pre-procedure baseline. Observe for changes in vital signs. Note any pain, signs and symptoms of infection, liver or spleen injury. Monitor closely for signs of pneumothorax. This would first be evidenced by increase in heart rate and drop in oxygen saturation and blood pressure. Patients are generally anxious, restless, and apprehensive. Later signs are tracheal deviation and subcutaneous emphysema. Unintended complications can include pneumothorax, as just described, hemothorax, hemorrhage, hypotension, cough, pain, infection at the puncture site, protocardia from vasovagal reflex, liver or spleen laceration, which is the predominant cause of hemorrhage, and re-expansion pulmonary edema, believed to occur as a result of overdraining of fluid too quickly. An interesting note, though, some colleagues at Bath, Israel, and Boston did a study involving 185 patients who underwent large-volume thoracentesis, over one liter removal, concluded that clinical and radiographic re-expansion pulmonary edema after large volume thoracentesis is rare and independent of the volume of fluid removed, pleural pressures, and pleural elastins. The recommendations to terminate thoracentesis after removing one liter of fluid needs to be reconsidered. Large effusions can and should be drained completely, as long as the chest discomfort and re-expiratory pleural pressures are less than minus 20 centimeters of water do not develop. The study was published in the Annals of Thoracic Surgery, June 2007. Now, let's talk about paracentesis. This procedure, not unlike that of the thoracentesis, is the cannulation and removal of accumulated fluid for diagnostic and or therapeutic purposes. In this case, it is accessing the peritoneal cavity rather than pleural space. This procedure is generally tolerated well, but still carries the risk of infection, excessive bleeding, and perforation of the bowel. The most common causes of ascites include cirrhosis, severe liver disease, and a metastatic cancer. Other causes include peritonitis and conditions that interfere with venous return, such as heart failure or valvular disease. Indications for paracentesis are to relieve abdominal discomfort, to decrease the work of breathing by reducing the contour pressure from the diaphragm and to sample the fluid for diagnostic purposes. Contraindication for paracentesis include coagulopathies. This is a relative contraindication for just about every procedure, but it is important to mention so we can keep in mind the interventions that can be taken pre-procedure to offset risk of bleeding. Pregnancy. Distended urinary bladder, distended bowel, abdominal wall cellulitis, and intra-abdominal adhesions. 
Pre-procedure care is similar to thoracentesis. You will start with the procedure card, an ultrasound. Get a paracentesis kit from the side door from the procedure card. You will notice that para and thora kit look alike. Just look closer at the charge sticker and it will indicate what type of kit it is. You will need buffered lidocaine and vacutainers or another collection device. If a diagnostic tap is being performed, be prepared with appropriate collection medium, blood and fungal culture bottles. If one of the procedure center physicians will be doing your paracentesis, they have a specific list of supplies, many of which you will find on the procedure card. However, you will want to double check for the transfer docking device, smart tip device and large bore tubing as these items are not yet stocked in our unit's procedure card. Call procedure center to have these items sent to you in preparation for the procedure. Before going any further, Remember your standards of procedural safety and complete your pre-procedure care. Consider past medical history, especially abdominal injury, liver disease, and portal hypertension. Have a working knowledge of your patient's fluid electrolyte status and anticipate changes in reduction of circulating blood volumes and electrolyte disturbances. Assess for bowel and bladder distension. Decompress bladder before procedure. Do they have a coagulopathy? Do they need to take any steps to mitigate bleeding risks? Think of allergies. Be sure to check with your patient and family and explain the procedure and see if they have any further questions. Check to make sure the proceduralist is credentialed to perform the intervention. Finally, be sure the consent is signed and initiate and document timeout before the procedure gets underway. Let's go through the intra-procedural interventions to maintain sterility and safety. Start by double-checking yourself to make sure you have everything you need for the procedure in the room, including any additional vacutainer bottles or another available collection device, culture bottles, or special supplies for the procedure center docks. Wash hands for at least 15 seconds, then put on cap, mask, and gloves. Maintain sterile procedure with all assists. If you're holding the patient to assist, be sure to avoid getting near the sterile drapes. Keep an eye on the patient's vital signs with a special concern for hemodynamic changes. Assist with fluid collection if required. Immediate post-procedure care should focus on ensuring hemostasis at the puncture site, assessing vital signs for hemodynamic changes, and observing for pain. Severe pain during or after insertion could be a sign of bowel perforation. Ongoing monitoring includes checking vital signs, intake and output, changes in abdominal girth, severe pain, weakness, infection, bleeding, and monitoring electrolytes. Complications to look out for following a paracentesis include perforation in the bowel, bladder, or stomach, Laceration of major vessel, such as vessel, mesenteric, iliac, or aorta. Abdominal wall hematoma. Lacerations of a catheter and loss into peritoneal space. Incisional hernias. Local or systemic infections. Hypovolemia. Hypotension and shock. Bleeding from the insertion site. Acetic fluid leak from the incision. Peritonitis. Fortunately, the incidence of the serious complications are rare and we are more apt to deal with leaking fluid and limited bleeding at the incisional site. This is the end of the tutorial on thoracentesis and paracentesis. Thank you so much for your attention.